Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar on the effects of medical experiences on childhood development. Before we introduce the speaker, I want to take just a few, make a few brief announcements. I know some of you are listening in from afar and aren't able to attend local events or programs. That's one of the main reasons we provide this webinar series. Parents and professionals alike can register for any of our free webinars and have access to helpful topics and experienced presenters. We host multiple webinars per month, so please visit our website at www.johnson-center.org to view the current 2016 schedule. We are adding some more and more exciting webinars to the series and schedule, so if you're not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the Join Our Email List link that appears on the homepage. To get instant news on events from the Johnson Center, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and last-minute events and presentations there. You can find links for those on our website as well. We do have a couple of exciting events coming up here in Austin. Our wonderful SIB Camp program is hosting several summer camps this year. Siblings ages 8 to 16 will have an amazing time while learning leadership skills and earning service hours. We'll also be hosting three social skills camps this summer for kids ages 6 to 16 with new camp dates just added in August. For more information on these camps, please contact us at info at johnson-center.org or by calling the office. And for local families looking for some inclusive summer free fun, be sure to check out the Junior Series this summer featuring Junior Scientist, Junior Chef, and Junior Helper Days. Junior Scientist is this Saturday from 1 to 3 at the Austin Recreation Center. At this free event, all kids ages 4 to 10 can participate in hands-on science experiments and fun games. The event is free, but an RSVP to info at johnson-center.org is required. More information can be found on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative and they share some great resources on their website and social media pages. Now before we begin the presentation today, please note that questions may be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation and time permitting they'll be addressed during the presentation. Also for those of you that have requested copies of this presentation, we don't send out the presentation slides, however we do post full recordings of all our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Please first search for us on YouTube and subscribe to get full access to all of our recorded webinars. Additional resources and information will also be available on our blog found at our website. We are offering certificates of attendance for this webinar and a link to complete a short quiz will be emailed to you one hour after the presentation concludes. Today's webinar is being presented by Gina Hill. Gina received her bachelor's in psychology with a minor in early childhood intervention from Texas State University and then she went on to obtain her master's degree in family and child studies on the child life track. She completed a child life practicum and child life internship at the Children's Hospital in San Antonio. While there, she was placed in the hospital's outpatient clinic, as well as completed her internship rotations in the GI unit and emergency department. Gina has worked as the family care coordinator and certified child life specialist here at the Johnson Center for over five years, using her training in childhood development, special education, early intervention, family systems and stress, and developmental disabilities to serve our community, and she is an essential member of the Johnson Center team. Now please welcome our presenter, Gina Hill. Hi everyone. Today we will be discussing the impact of hospitalizations or other medical experiences on early childhood development. Research has found that long-term illnesses and traumatic medical experiences can lead to high stress and anxiety for our younger population. The stress of these experiences can result in negatively impacting a child's motor, cognitive, emotional, and social development. During our webinar today, we will be discussing ways to identify and address those children that are at risk due to traumatic medical experience. Before we start, I'd like to get a better understanding of our audience today. Please take a moment to let us know if you are a healthcare provider, a parent, therapist, or other professional. Wow, it looks like we have a variety of parents and professionals here with us today. This is great. I hope that our parents really get a better understanding of how to prepare their young children for medical encounters. I also hope that our healthcare professionals and therapists will be able to recognize some of these characteristics and be more cognizant of long-term effects when working with this very young age population.
So today's goals, we will work on increasing the audience understanding of the stages of child development. We will be describing the impact of medical experiences on development, as well as providing intervention strategies to support early childhood development. So what are the stages of child development? Well, while the stress of medical experiences can negatively impact development in all ages, today we will focus on early childhood, specifically those within the one to five age range. This is important as early childhood development is the key and any signs of regression or stress should be addressed immediately. So today we'll be talking through the neonatal stage, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Before we move into our developmental stages, I'd like to first discuss some common fears associated with hospitalizations and other medical experiences. Items such as wearing a tourniquet, a medical wrap, or mask can be seen as frightening. Even getting an MRI or taking oral medication can be met with resistance or fear. These stressors are not limited to hospitals. They can occur at doctor's offices or outpatient clinics. The stress can even be seen at dentist's office. Here at the Johnson Center, we often provide patients with procedural support during things like having a physical, a blood draw, or other medical procedures. We understand that even a tourniquet can be scary and try to help our kids become familiar with those items. There are times when walking by the procedure room can trigger a response from our patients, so redirecting them or planning a different route can be helpful. Take a moment to think about your working environment and what stressors, if any, can provoke fear or anxiety for young children. So the first stage, the neonatal stage, specifically zero to one month. There are many developmental theories that outline a child's cognitive and social emotional development. Today, we will be discussing some of the more common theories associated with child development. And one of the first developmental theorists that many of you may be familiar with is Eric Erickson. He believed that in this developmental stage, children were moving through a period of trust versus mistrust. During this stage, the infant is uncertain about the world in which they live. Newborns will develop a sense of trust when caregivers continually provide care and affection. Newborns trust that their caregivers and their environment will provide basic needs, such as nourishment and safety. This results in feelings of hope and drive. By developing a sense of trust, the children can have hope that as new crises arise, there is a real possibility that people will be there as a source of support. According to this theory of development, mistrust and fear of people and surroundings can lead to withdrawal and depression in later years. For example, if the care has been harsh, inconsistent, unpredictable, and unreliable, then the infant will develop a sense of mistrust and will not have confidence in the world around them or in their abilities to influence events. This infant will carry the basic sense of mistrust with them to other relationships, which may result in anxiety, heightened insecurities, and an overwhelming feeling of mistrust in the world around them. According to Piaget's theory of development, children in this age group are in their sensory motor stage. And in this early stage, children experience and gain knowledge through their senses and motor movements. Newborns are quickly learning to communicate and interact with their new surroundings. As children interact with their new environment, they gain an immense amount of cognitive growth in a short period of time. Some key things to remember about the sensory motor stage is that an infant's knowledge of the world is limited to his or her sensory perceptions and motor activities. Behaviors are limited to simple motor responses caused by sensory stimuli. And children utilize these skills and abilities that they're born with, such as looking, sucking, grasping, and listening to learn more about their environment. Some primary concerns within this stage of development that we should be aware of. One is pain. 
A typical response from this age group can include crying. This is a very natural reaction to a response to an unfavorable situation, pain, or uncertainty. While crying can be a very common reaction, this does not negate the urgency to provide treatment support to reduce long-term effects due to stress or medical trauma. For newborns that experience traumatic event, it's important to recognize that although they may not remember the event, the pain is significant and real. Many times invasive procedures are completed without acknowledgement of the unique needs of these patients. And in a stage of development when trust is most easily lost, this is a significant factor to consider. It's also important to remember that infants do not have a concept of time. The fact that pain can be temporary, can be more or less extreme, or will subside is a learned concept that comes from experience. And so for newborns, pain is all-consuming and never-ending. While studies suggest that children younger than seven months do not distinguish primary caregivers from strangers, bonding is still a significant factor for development. In, cases, in some cases, newborns are deprived of interaction with their primary caregiver. And going back to our stages of development, we know that trust is an important part of building healthy relationships and secure attachment. And these experiences help frame how these infants respond to their caregiver. In a stressful environment, the risk of being separated from a caregiver for a long period of time may be very high. And sensory overload. Exposure to loud noises, bright lights, and sudden movements can be perceived as traumatic for this age group. Most environments are conducive in providing a relaxed setting for our newborns. However, there are some experiences that are more stress-provoking. And in these cases, acknowledging sensory input should be addressed. So again, I encourage you to take a moment and think about your own working environment and any stressors that a newborn may encounter while visiting you. So how does this impact development? A newborn's brain is developing rapidly. Interaction with caregivers can provide that stimulation needed for healthy brain de development. Restriction to this type of interaction and support may hinder this development. We also know that newborns are seeking interaction to develop communication skills. Crying, again, is a typical response when trying to communicate, but newborns may also attempt to communicate through eye tracking, cooing, touching, and these connections help to strengthen the bond between the infant and caregiver. So when these opportunities for communication are not given, there's a risk for not developing a secure attachment between the primary caregiver and the infant. I also want to note that as we talk about developmental concerns with our newborns and risks associated with their medical experiences, it's also important to remember that they aren't the only ones affected by this experience. If a secure relationship with a caregiver is compromised, that parent may also suffer from stress and anxiety. Typically, newborns are born with all five senses and quickly learn to recognize the primary caregiver's face, voice, and smell. Their sense of touch is easily developed and they explore through mouthing. Newborns also respond to taste, smell, and sounds, and while their vision is believed to be the weakest of the senses at this time, it's still rapidly developing. So they have the basic reflexes such as rooting or turning their head toward an object close to their mouth. And as these infants continue to learn and grow, appropriate stimuli and space are necessary to explore and develop. And in an environment, again, that may be overstimulating, those sights, sounds, and tastes can be detrimental. Loud noises, bright lights, bitter tastes can create a hostile environment. So recognizing these as developmental factors can help to create an environment that is, again, conducive and supportive to these areas of growth. So how can we provide some intervention knowing these risks? The important thing to do is address the specific concerns regarding attachment, bonding, and trust. So creating opportunities for parents and infants to be together without interruption is necessary. Parents should be encouraged to spend as much time as possible doing things such as bathing, feeding, changing, and playing with their infant. One study measured the effects of early contact between mothers and their firstborn children. 
a control group was allowed the limited contact, which is routine in most hospitals, and another group was allowed a full hour in the first two hours of life, as well as five additional hours on each successive day. At one month and one year, these mothers showed closer ties to their child. At two years, these children asked more questions. And at five years, these children had significantly higher IQs and better language. Providing family-centered care. In providing a family-centered care approach to treatment, this emphasizes the importance of recognizing parents as an important member in a child's medical treatment. As mentioned previously, caregivers and parents are likely to feel higher levels of stress during their child's medical experience. And during this time, parents may also feel distant from their child and reliant on, on medical or healthcare professionals to address the child's needs. So without intention, healthcare professionals are jeopardizing that significant bond between a newborn and their caregiver. In providing a family-centered care approach, healthcare professionals can support that bond, decreasing the stress related to the child's medical experience. Research has shown that when parents feel valued and part of their child's medical treatment, that sense of control and respect really helps to decrease their feelings of stress and anxiety. I want us to really take a look at this image. We'll go back to it again during the webinar, but really offering a family-centered care approach where healthcare professionals can share information, provide dignity and respect to parents, collaborate with them, and help them in participating can help frame that relationship. It's also important to provide affection and comfort for this very, very young age population. Again, going back to identifying areas of deprivation or overstimulation, you can do things such as monitoring feeding times and providing sensory stimulation only when appropriate. Maybe you can modify or make accommodations depending on the environment, such as changing the bright lights or the sounds or the smells. Some examples would be to use some soothing sound toys, such as a heartbeat simulator, which replicates the sounds heard in the womb. These comforting items can be used during a procedure or an invasive um, procedure or medical experience to provide support. And then again, going back to our knowledge of child development, we know that these young individuals are seeking affection and comfort to feel secure in their environment, and touch plays a key role in providing this. Techniques such as kangaroo care, where an infant is held skin to skin, such as the image here, with an adult, can help provide this type of support. This provides a significant, such a significant response. Um, in fact, some studies suggest that preterm infants who experience kangaroo care have improved cognition, decreased levels of stress, reduced pain responses, and positive growth and development of motor functioning. Ideally, physical contact should occur between immediate family members, but in the event that a parent cannot be present, healthcare professionals should attempt to coordinate some type of physical presence for a newborn as often as possible. Moving into our infants, specifically one month to 12 months, they are again going through the stages of trust versus mistrust. And in continuing this stage of development, early opportunities for trust have likely occurred, which have helped to establish a, a secure bond with these parents and patients. Unlike infants that may not be aware of the distinction between their primary caregiver and a stranger, older infants are now learning to recognize faces and have preferences. So therefore, it's an, an infant's first crisis may very well be when they are separated from their caregiver. They are also in their sensory motor stage, where infants are learning to assess their surrounding through their gross and fine motor skills. Exploration and curiosity of their environment help these young individuals to learn and grow. Unlike our neonatal population, in infancy, object permanence is likely to be mastered. A child is now able to recognize and understand objects continue to exist when they cannot be observed. So imagine a game of peekaboo, for example. A very young infant will believe that the person or object has actually vanished and will act shocked or startled when the object reappears. 
older infants are now have the ability are, are likely to be working on the ability to master object permanence and realize that when the person or object hides in the game of peekaboo, they continue to exist even though they are unseen. So this can be really challenging when medical encounters force an infant to become separated from their primary caregiver for a long period of time. If you can imagine, if object permanence is mastered, this actually increases the infant's awareness of being separated from their caregiver. They may see the separation as something final and don't yet have the ability to understand that their caregiver will return, which can cause fear and distress for the infant. And we'll discuss some of these challenges further in the next section. So some primary concerns with this stage of development. Going into separation anxiety and continuing our discussion of being separated from caregivers, during medical encounters, infants may experience or be at risk of developing separation anxiety. This is common for infants between the ages of 8 and 14 months and occurs as infants begin to understand that they are separate persons from their prim primary caregiver. Infants oftentimes look for their caregiver to give them a sense of comfort and familiarity, which causes separation to become really challenging. We should also address pain management. Will this pain ever end? Similar to newborns, infants do not have a concept of time. Pain and illness can be seen as death or deprivation. Fortunately, since they have more of a now concept of time, interventions in pain and management can be incorporated to that medical experience to make it a more positive encounter. And developing or achieving developmental milestones. So significant gains in social emotional development, language development, cognitive development, and physical development occur in this stage. And your infant is starting to recognize familiar faces, learning to copy sounds. They can express happy or sad emotions. They may begin to sit, crawl, stand. Some may begin to walk independently. So when they experience high levels of stress or anxiety, these domains are all at risk. While discussing some concerns, I also want to mention some typical behavioral responses from this age population. Along with crying, infants may respond to their hospital and medical experience in a variety of very natural ways. A change in eating or sleeping may occur, or you may see a change in bowel movements. But once your child is home again and the routine is established, these normal patterns should return. So how does this impact their development? So again, in an overstimulating environment, hearing and vision may be impacted. This creates a risk for further cognitive and motor skill development. This age group also does not recognize or anticipate danger or pain until it happens. They depend on the caregiver's presence and support to soothe and calm, and they may not have the ability to, or the skill set to calm their own fears. Babies at this age quickly develop new skills, and hospital restrictions may delay or hinder an infant's ability to practice or acquire those necessary skills or achieve those necessary developmental milestones such as rolling, sitting, crawling, or walking. So all of these things may be delayed. How can we help? Again, going back to that family-centered care model, in this stage of development, infants are more aware of their primary caregiver and they can respond to their emotions. So if a parent displays significantly high levels of stress and anxiety, the child will feel and respond to that intense emotion. And this may result in crying, becoming anxious, or maybe even less responsive to intervention. So to ease the anxiety of parents, staff should provide consistent support and information to them and allow those parents to be active members in their child's treatment. Again, it goes back to information sharing, dignity and respect, and collaboration. You can also provide appropriate stimulation for these children to help them meet their developmental milestones. So allowing opportunities for touch, um, stroking, patting, rocking, soothing music. You can even put a mobile in their crib. All of these things can really help. In our next stage of development, we will be discussing toddlers, those within the one to three year age category.
According to Erickson, in this stage, children are going through autonomy versus shame and doubt. In this stage of development, children need to develop a sense of control and have opportunities for independence. Successful progression through this stage of development will lead to autonomy, while failure may result in feelings of shame and doubt. Piaget referred to this stage as the sensory motor pre-operational stage of development. So these infants are continuing to learn through sensory input, but now they have mastered their language and can be used to meet de demands. So I'm sorry, these toddlers are now continuing in that sensory input. Object permanence, again, has been mastered. They are starting to use proper syntax and grammar to express full concepts, and although they have general comprehension, imagination, and symbolic thinking are used to resolve confusion and misunderstanding of their environment. We'll go back to that later on um, on these slides. I'd like to take a moment now to talk with you about um, a film that we'll be showing here. It's a short clip. Some of you may be aware of the study and film, A Two-Year-Old Goes to the Hospital, filmed in 1952 by James Robertson. While visiting children's wards, Robertson observed an extreme amount of distress among infants and toddlers. During this period, visiting hours were restricted and children received minimal sensory and social interaction. While the patients received adequate medical care from physicians and nurses, these clinicians seemed unaware of the social and emotional suffering of their patients. Robertson recognized the urgency to address the situation However, his research initially on the subject was met with resistance. So Robertson decided to create a film that would document the evidence to support his research. In the film, Laura, age two, is in the hospital for eight days to have a minor operation. She is too young to understand her mother's absence. Because her mother is not there and the nurses change frequently, she has to face the fears, frights, and hurts with no familiar person to cling to. She is extremely upset, and then she becomes quiet and settles. At the end of her stay, she is withdrawn from her mother, shaken in her trust. Here is a clip of the study.
I apologize. We seem to be having some trouble with the sound. I would encourage our audience to YouTube the film, A Two-Year-Old Goes to the Hospital. You'll find that it's narrated and they walk you through what her experiences are. There's actually a longer clip if you'd like to look into the actual study. Um, but I think that this really paved the way for how healthcare professionals and parents recognized the urgency to address how a child can really regress or have that attachment delayed from their primary caregiver. Again, I apologize for the inconvenience of the sound. So moving on, based on the study, Robertson and fellow researchers observed a break in the child's attachment bonds. So as they observed Laura in the hospital, they characterized the phases as such. The first phase that she entered was the protest phase, in which the child is visibly distressed, calls and cries for his or her mother. The child reunited in this stage will usually be quite difficult for some time. It's as though they are punishing their caregiver for going away. The next phase they noticed that she entered into was the despair phase. A child can be seen very quiet, withdrawn, miserable, and apathetic during this time. The child almost gives up hope that their mother will return and may appear to be settling down which unfortunately may be seen as a positive characteristic by staff members. And entering into the last phase is the denial and detachment phase, where a child shows more interest in their surroundings and interacts with others, but seems hardly to know the caregiver when they visit or even care when they leave, which is why the third stage detachment appears to be the most serious. So when eventually reunited with family members, the child can seem quite changed and now appears superficial, emotionally distant, and the relationship with others tend to be shallow and untrusting. This is also the most difficult stage to undo. So children in this stage of development are still susceptible to the previous problems we've discussed, such as separation anxiety. However, in this stage, these problems are compounded by other factors. Toddlers are in the process of gaining new skills, such as self-feeding and toilet training. And hospitalizations often require the child to temporar temporarily yield some of these skills. So even doing things such as completing a simple urine test can disrupt the process of how they've learned. Regression or a loss of newly acquired skills may also occur. So many children in this stage will regress back to earlier phases of development. You might see some bedwetting or thumb sucking that may occur. And in addition, acquisition of new skills may be limited. Again, we're talking about being in a harsh environment where they're not able to meet those necessary developmental milestones. And the influence of hospitalization or the lacking mobility can hinder opportunities to learn and practice gross and fine motor skills. An important thing to consider in this stage of development is that a two-year-old or a toddler may have a, a misconception and fear that pain is punishment. So in this stage, they have a very egocentric view of the world, believing everything happens to them and that they're causing everything. So they may think that they are the cause of the pain or the cause of the medical procedure. And while their verbal abilities are quickly developing, they may still be unable to adequately communicate that to you. So how does this impact their development? With the risk of regression or lack of appropriately necessary stimulation for growth, children in this stage are at development or a risk of not meeting their milestones they may fall behind in their cognitive, physical, language, or social development. And again, going back to that risk of separation anxiety, they can develop, uh, they can develop a sense of mistrust, again, going back to that early stage, and building strong attachment with caregivers and developing long-term healthy relationships. 
Again, loss of autonomy and independence may also make children in this stage have problems with self-doubt and independence. So we are really talking about affecting their long-term relationships and their sense of self-independence. How can we help? Healthcare members can learn so much through a child's play, and it's especially important in this stage of development. Familiar toys from home should be part of the hospital's play program. Children should also be encouraged to lead play sessions, providing opportunities for autonomy in play, going back to that theory of development. Play can also be implemented during procedures. For example, during our blood draws, we frequently use the iPad as a distraction. Games that are interactive and do not require a lot of physical coordination are great in providing that type of stimulation during this time. We also highly encourage the use of bubbles. This allows for deep breathing exercises while also having fun. We make a game out of counting how many bubbles we see or trying to blow different sizes of the bubbles. And providing choices. Offering different activities or letting the child choose the game and leading the play sessions. And if you don't have access to games, offer choices in other creative ways, such as allowing the child to choose what color of band-aid they get. You can also provide procedural support, which one, procedure, one form of procedural support would be positioning for comfort. This increases the comfort of children and parents as well as medical staff. This model has five parts. The first, you can invite the parent or caregiver to be present, prepare the child and parent for the procedure and for their role during the procedure, and utilize the treatment room for stressful procedures. So positioning the child in a comforting manner and maintaining a calm, positive atmosphere can help. In our office, we found that for our very young children, sitting on a caregiver's lap can really make a difference. Our last stage of development, our preschool kiddos. Erickson referred to this stage as initiative versus guilt. In this stage of development, children begin to initiate, not imitate, activities. There's a great curiosity and openness to learning. You may hear the word why many, many, many times. Children are also beginning to assert control and leadership over their environment. Resolution through this stage of development can lead to feeling that they can initiate plans and make decisions, and they can lead others. Success in this stage can also lead to a sense of purpose in later years. However, if a child is not able to progress through this stage, they may be at risk of fearing that everything self-initiated will go wrong. Children also tend to exert too much control, may experience disapproval, which can lead to a sense of guilt. Piaget referred to this stage as the pre-operational stage, in which children are learning to use proper syntax and grammar to express full concepts, and a child's thinking is dominated by perceptions of physical features. During this stage of development, children are developing their use of logical thinking, and complex or abstract thoughts can be a little difficult or challenging. So some primary concerns within this stage of development. Magical thinking. Preschoolers often engage in pretend play. This allows them to test out new identities, to develop theories about the way other people think, and to practice social skills. Magical thinking tends to coincide with this pretend play, and young children often have fantastical beliefs about what can and cannot happen. Magical thinking tends to fade as children begin to master concepts of logic and cause and effect. For young children, experiences such as hospitalizations or medical encounters for the first time, children can engage in magical thinking and create wild interpretations of their experience. They can use their imagination to fill in the blanks of what they don't understand about their experience. 
This can easily occur during preparation or explanation of diagnosis. One common concern is a fear of anesthesia. A child may misinterpret an explanation such as, this medicine will put you to sleep, and may remember an encounter with a pet or refer to an expression that was used in which someone doesn't wake up. Social skills are also a significant part of the stage of development, and peer interaction is pretty significant. Children have transitioned from parallel or simple social play to cooperative play. They are initiating interactions and use playing with peers. As they learn to interact with one another, they develop a sense of identity, again, leadership, appropriate boundaries. Restricting peer interaction can have significant implications for this age group. And how does this impact their overall development? Their cognitive and social development may suffer as a result of frequent hospital or medical visits. Changes in routine can also alter their sense of security. So preparation is key in providing expectations. And how do we help? A lot of these interventions and long-term impacts really build as these developmental stages progress. So we're really talking about going back to the early stages of developing, development and implementing those same interventions such as family-centered care. That really goes across the board in all stages. But specifically for this age population in where a risk of magical thinking occurs, it's helpful to address their level of concern. So things such as Medical play can really help to, one, realize what those misconceptions of their experience are and work through it in a way that's very normal for them. So medical play is when you help prepare young children for a procedure that may be difficult for them to comprehend. So you can try using a doll or other toys to walk through what they can expect. And if you know your child is going to have something like maybe a blood draw or a shot, you can act that out using a doll or a medical playset. Uncertainty about a procedure can heighten fear, anxiety, and tension in both the parent and child. These feelings can limit a child's ability to develop feelings of control over the procedure. So during the medical play session, allow for free exploration and use of the medical equipment. This will provide the child going back to that sense of control and leadership. And coping through play is helpful in recognizing and addressing any misconceptions regarding the medical procedure. You can also provide some type of distraction. So during the medical procedure, try talking or sharing stories with our preschoolers. You can use some guided or coached breathing. Again, we go back to blowing up bub or blowing bubbles or maybe acting out blowing up a balloon to help create those deep breathing exercises. In our office, we use counting as a measure. So relaxed counting, going maybe up to 10, up to 20, or going in reverse can help. Or if a parent knows that the child likes a specific song, you can have that prepared for them. The use of guided imagery has been really helpful in the past. And this is where you use words or music to evoke positive imagery in a subject with a view to bring about a beneficial effect. And really using details. So imagining where you're at in time or space and then really putting color and texture into your thought process. How does this feel? What does this look like? And let the child guide you in that. It's important to remember to use clear, concise language so if you are trying to provide a reassuring explanation about an upcoming procedure, watch the language that you're using, making sure it's not harsh. Um, listen to the details of what you're saying. Um, even things such as as long as or as big as may be hard for this age population to comprehend. Going back to our procedural support using comfort positioning, in our experience, a bear hug or a hold from behind works extremely well with our young population. It works best when a caregiver can position themselves behind the child and control the upper body. And then if you cross your legs over the child's legs, this can inhibit kicking. 
So many times parents will want to force the child to either look away or they may instinctively place their hands over the child's eyes. As we mentioned before, if a parent is stressed, the child most likely will have higher levels of stress. And turning a child's head away or covering the eyes is almost validating that fear, letting the child know, hey, this is scary, you shouldn't look. And as we talked about before, that magical thinking can help them to fill in the blanks of what they're not seeing. All of a sudden, a child feels pain and can't see, and they fill that in with what they imagine that looks like. So if, if you can imagine, that could be pretty traumatic. So understanding that not all, all children will benefit from seeing the medical procedure, maybe you can create fun ways to help provide some type of um, wall or barricade from them seeing, such as using an iSpy book or some type of iPad to help create a barrier. So I know this was a lot of information we covered in a short amount of time. Um, I'd like to take this time to now answer any questions that you may have. We have a, a great question on how and um, when these interventions can be applied to children with autism. I think that really with all of these interventions that we described today, such as family-centered care, comfort positioning, the use of distraction, can really be modified to fit the needs of this population. Here at the Johnson Center, again, we go back to providing comfort positioning and really talking with the parent about their role during any type of experience. We have done medical play in the past. Um, providing routine and structure can be really helpful. Um, so I think if you do have a child that experiences frequent medical visits or um, encounters, doing things such as procedural preparation and helping them to become familiar with some of these items can be really helpful. Um, one thing that we didn't discuss during this webinar, but we discussed in a different webinar that I would encourage you to look at on our YouTube page, um, is the creation of a social story. So you can, if, if you're practitioner or your clinician that you're working with is comfortable, you can take photos of the event and then create a social story. If you go to our website, we have actually created a social story for our patients and families that you are welcome to use. Um, that really helps walk them through what to expect um, in, in detail and clear, concise language. We took photos of who they will see. That way when they're here, they have seen photos of them. They're familiar with the person that is coming to meet them. Um, and then you can also find YouTube videos online of social stories that can be used.
Hey, another question. As a healthcare provider, when should I start integrating the family into the treatment planning process? This is great because this really helps open our conversation on family-centered care. And I think starting from the very beginning is key. That way, as a healthcare provider, you can really assess what the stress level of the parent is and what information they're really attending to. So sometimes what happens is a, a parent who is highly stressed may not be fully attending when you are trying to explain what your recommendations are and then they go home and they may not recall all that information, they may be very confused, and they may be less likely to implement those interventions or recommendations because they were in such a high state of anxiety at the time. And if you don't have that relationship or have built that rapport and you don't recognize how important it is to involve a parent in that, then it's less likely that the patient will actually continue to provide or that the parent will continue to provide your recommendations. Um, so it's really helpful to build that rapport from the ver very beginning, integrating them as much as possible and letting them know you're willing to share all the information you have as long as that's reciprocal and they're checking in with you. So therefore, if they have any questions, they feel comfortable coming back and asking you or asking another staff member. Another question, if we know our child has high anxiety, what can we do as parents to prepare for the doctor's visit? I think this is a great question because even for a child that does not have a history of anxiety, preparation is really key. Um, on our website, you can find a social story called A Visit to the Johnson Center where we have outlined everything from the front door that a child sees, all of the faces that a child may see while they're here, and what their role is. Um, you can also call for hospital tours or visits if you know your child is going to have a procedure. Um, just because once you're familiar with that setting and you come in at a time when you do not have high anxiety, confusion, or pain, you're more likely to be receptive. And then when you come back, you don't have that fear. It's also important, um, and I'll actually just move to this next slide, that early experiences last a lifetime. I love the saying because you really are building a foundation. And if you create a strong, positive foundation in your medical experience, you're more likely to have a child that has decreased anxiety and the next time they visit will feel like they are more comfortable in this environment. For your information, I've lifted, listed a couple of references. Um, at the very bottom, if you would like to um, complete a survey, you can visit this website. I think that you will also be emailed for the survey if you would like some certificate of, uh, a certificate of attendance. A couple more questions before we end our, our webinar today. We had a question for recommendations or resources for kids older than six, adults or teens. Um, I do want to note that we are working on our second portion of this webinar for interventions and support strategies for children that are older and we'll talk a lot about what characteristics to watch out for for those age populations. Um, we would also have some information on our Johnson Center website, and so keep a lookout for some blogs. Another question, what to do after a child has a traumatic experience? We briefly talked about medical play to provide preparation, but I think that this is really something can, that can also be done before and after the fact. And again, reiterating, play is really important for a young child, especially our, our preschool population, because it really gives parents and professionals a better understanding of what that anxiety is and where it's located. Um, so when a child acts out the play session, you can see what misinterpretations they may have. Um, for example, I had an experience where we had a play session and the child said that the little baby had to get a shot on their eye and they kept 
giving the shot in the eye. And so we talked about while they're here, they won't actually have to have a shot in their eye. And what that said to me was that a ch this child felt like they were having so many invasive procedures and they didn't know where that pain was located or where to expect it next. Um, so that's just an example of where you can see kind of that magical thinking or how the young child can kind of fill in the blanks in their understanding and then you as a practitioner or a parent can realize through play what the child is actually fearing. Um, things to do after a child has a medical experience in addition to medical play, um, I think talking to your healthcare provider because if a child is likely to have to go back or frequently visit, you want that facility to have preparation for the, the stress and maybe you can talk with them about ways to reduce that. And if that means coming up with coping mechanisms like the use of an iPad or a familiar toy, um, a favorite video that the staff can have available, um, that way it kind of decreases that stress over time. Um, suggestions for dentist's office. More and more we're seeing high anxiety with our kids that are going to the dentist. So I think a lot of these interventions that we talked about can be modified. So again, maybe creating a social story to prepare for the dentist's visit. Um, maybe talking to your dentists about similar items that they can try at home. If you know that they're going to have to sit, they know that they're going to have to put a sheet over their chest, maybe you can practice that. And then once they're there, I think, again, going back to that family-centered care approach, really acknowledging with your dentist, hey, my child has really high anxiety. What can we do to work on that? And if they don't have any resources for you, then maybe you can suggest some. Like, maybe we can create a social story together. Would you mind if we took some photos in your office? That way we can use that to prepare our child the next visit. So I think that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and if you would like more information or if you have any additional questions, you can send that to info at johnson-center.org. Thank you.